Hello everyone, welcome to MHTV tonight. Um, tonight we're joined by Rebecca Bevington, who we'll introduce in a minute. And we're going to be talking about films, arts and books and mental health. We've called tonight the heart of mental health, H-A-R-T. Um, and we've already had a little bit of a debate on that about language, um, which I think is really important to feed into tonight's chat, um, given that we're talking about mental health, which, you know, highly stigmatised um, topic. So um, we'll say a bit more about that in a minute, but I'm going to hand over to Rebecca, first of all, to introduce herself. So over to you, Rebecca. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Rebecca. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of York in the English department. Um, my research looks at representations of refugee women in literature. Uh, so I'm really interested in things like societal exclusion um, and different political and psychological uh, aspects of societal exclusion. Um, and I also help run the social library with Vanessa, uh, where we have some really interesting discussions about the relationship between storytelling and mental health. Um, and sometimes just to talk about different books and plays and poetry that we really like. So I'm really excited to be here. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, thank you. And um, Nikki, do you want to say a few words about social yeah. media? Absolutely. So we really would love to hear from you. Some people have already joined in already. So thank you for those guys who've done that. If you're joining in on Twitter, just follow us under the hashtag MHTV. And if you're on the Facebook live page, please start a conversation with us. We really want to hear your ideas, your opinions. And if there's any sort of art, culture, books, anything at all that has moved you or you think helps us to understand or explore mental health more, please let us know about it. Thank you. Yeah. Definitely. And just to say on that note, we've already had a few suggestions, haven't we, in the last few days on Twitter. So that's been great that there's already been um, some conversation. And um, and as, as Nikki says, this conversation's for everybody, really. We don't want to feel that um, we're talking about literature that excludes any, anybody. It's about um, anything, really, that touches you or appeals to you, <laughs> or you feel that maybe even unsettles you, might have some sort of message linked to mental health then you know join in and share share that with us and um and I guess for me maybe that leads us to talk about Rebecca briefly about how we kind of connected because we worked together didn't we at the um, NHS Leadership Academy I can't remember how long ago it was now maybe about three years or something was it something like that yeah sure. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, maybe even longer, I'm not sure. But um, yeah, Rebecca and I um, used to have some really interesting conversations, didn't we, back in the day about sort of literature and, and books and mental health and health and, and leadership more generally. Um, and I think it's probably fair to say that probably influenced me in part going on and thinking about doing my English degree, which I'm doing at the moment. And, um, and during that time, we set up the social library, didn't we, which was really about um, creating a space on Facebook. And we chose Facebook because we felt that everybody tends to access Facebook, or at least most people, to um, to explore um, books, um, literature, art, anything really that's got a storytelling component that links to um, to sort of mental health and the sort of wider humanity. And that's, that's how that came about, wasn't it? And we've had a few... Um, interesting discussions on there with quite a kind of wide group of people really which has been interesting yeah I think um it was great it was quite interesting how it came about because I think like you say I was only in maybe my second year of undergrad back when we met um I was doing my English degree then 
uh, and still had quite a bit to learn and um, was quite early in my career in things, but uh, was also learning at the same time, working part time in the NHS uh, about um, caregiving and different types of care labour. Uh, and that's something that's definitely stayed with me um, since that time and also aspects of, you know, ill health uh, and, and mental health as well. So, yeah, I think it's just been this sort of convergence of two aspects that we're both very interested in and um, and also with the addition of uh, the perspectives of our group. We've had some um, really good discussions so far and, uh, yeah, hopefully we'll be able to continue that. Yeah. I think um, for me, what's really interesting and, um, you know, I went into nursing back in, you know, the early 90s. And um, I know when I went into mental health nursing, everybody around me was, you know, absolutely shocked that I'd gone into mental health nursing because everyone saw nursing as a science. And everybody who knew me when I was growing up knew that I was always immersed in books and kind of people expected, including my teachers, that I would do something more sort of literary with my life. And um, I argued right from the beginning when I first started nursing that I was led into mental health because what I was really interested in were people's stories. And um, and for me, like books give you that sort of human connection. And I think that books are probably what helped me develop, uh, you know, what I think is quite finely tuned empathy skills for other people and kind of being able to put myself into other people's um into other people's shoes I guess and see the world through other people's eyes so I think for me you know mental health nursing will always be an art as well as a science and I think you know there's a really close connection with the two so I think although it's only in recent years I've kind of gone back and thought I'd take the sort of English and and writing um degree a little bit further um, I think it's always been like an interest of mine. And Nikki, I don't know whether, I know we've had some conversations about this. Mm. Any thoughts? Too? Absolutely. We use it all the time in yeah. nurse education um, in a thing called expansive learning. And it really helps with loads of different things. So if you are um, nursing or giving care to someone, you need to have empathy. You need to be able to see lots of different perspectives, not just your own. And books just take you into different worlds take it inside the yeah. mind of somebody else that's absolutely amazing and with art we use a lot of the stuff and the tape modern I'll, I'll tweet them out the tape modern resources on slow looking and also on like investigating um key pieces of art are really really helpful so when you're assessing somebody you it's about how you notice and um and precise about detail but also how you interpret that and it's about how you then take that knowledge and then use it in order to be able to form a professional opinion so and it's the yeah. same skills you use when you're loving any kind of art you know, being able to look at the precise thing, be it a book and critique it, or a poem, or a piece of art, or a piece of cloth, or sculpture, anything, and, and be able to see exactly what you're looking at, but then also be able to interpret it. Because any art, isn't it, is, is somebody having a conversation with you. When a human being creates a piece of art, it's not for nobody to ever see it. It's for that person to either help them think through their own process or to reach out to other people. And that's the essence of nursing, I think. I, mm. big fan, in love with it. <laughs> Absolutely. I think it's so what quite interesting, sorry, just about um, the uh, the question of empathy and reading mm -hmm. as well, this, this really interesting sort of double dynamic where uh, on the one hand you do have that um, opportunity to put yourself into a different perspective and then at the same time there's the act of writing as well which I think is uh, so important to remember different forms of agency and resistance that can come about through writing um, and so it's this beautiful uh, double-sidedness to to reading and writing that's both mm -hmm. asserting your own identity and agency um, mm -hmm. and also having others be able to sort of step into that um, mm -hmm. and yeah I think that idea of, of voice is uh, probably really crucial within mental health as well yeah I think that's a really important point and something that I've picked up on you know looking at literature like more critically so like I was reading a book a few months ago um called The Vegetarian which I would really recommend anybody to read it's a brilliant um book and um and the the female character in it is essentially talking about her um decision to become vegetarian but it's more than that you know it's about her kind of taking control of her life in a very um, sort of patriarchal culture. And throughout the book, her kind of life gradually, um, uh, you know, unwinds as do, as do other characters around her. And um, I think, you know, I won't say more than that, because if, if you want to read it, I would really recommend it. 
But linking to um, Rebecca's point, what really interested me about that is it's told in three parts and each of the parts is told from somebody else's perspective. So the first perspective is about a husband and how inconvenient it was that she became vegetarian and um, the impact that that had on their life. And the second one is about her brother-in-law who um, Mm. has um, a sort of fixation with her. Mm. And the third part of it is told from the perspective of her sister. And they're each talking about, um, you know, the impact of her vegetarianism and her behaviour on their lives. But at no point does she have a voice in the story at all. And um, and I found that quite fascinating, really. And I think it really highlighted for me sort of how oppressed she was, but how um, through a behaviour she was taking control. But actually, she wasn't able to verbalise or articulate. And, and I guess for me, like parallels with you know, people who develop eating disorders and eating difficulties um, really kind of highlighted that for me within the story. So, yeah, there's one from me anyway. I think what's interesting about that example, because um, I've read I've read most of The Vegetarian, and I, I thought it was a, great, a brilliant story as well. Um, it's the absence of voice, isn't it, then, if she's using, yeah. sort of utilising the voices of others around her. And I think that's where there's the, the content of, a piece of literature or an artistic work, which is obviously important, but then there's also the form through which it's being told. Um, mm, yeah. And yeah, if it's the multiple different voices, none of which belong to her, it's just making this really um, profound point, I think, about, as you said, her lack of agency. And um, that can be as powerful as sort of like a first person voice sometimes. Um, but yeah, it's a brilliant book. I would also recommend it. I can't wait to finish it. <laughs> yeah, me too. So um, talking about lack of voice, I'm quite curious um, about your um, your studies at the moment. Um, sounds really interesting. Do you want to tell us a little bit more about what you're doing? Yeah, so at the moment, um, I'm looking at war memoirs. So uh, the testimonies of refugee women um, who've undergone some uh, really, really intense suffering in their life and um, some really intense trauma. Uh, and uh, much later they've come back to it and, and written the memoirs. The first is a book called The Girl Who Smiled Beads by uh, Clementine Wamaria, who is a um, survivor of the Rwandan uh, genocide in uh, the 1990s. Uh, and she was only about six years old, I think, when that was happening. So um, she's lived in numerous refugee camps throughout her life um, and also had to um, you know, undergo a, a lot of other challenges as well in um, basically getting a life back on track afterwards. Uh, and she talks she talks about it in depth in that book. Um, and then I've compared that in, um, in uh, the early stages of my PhD thesis, I've compared that to another memoir, which um, recalls the Liberian civil wars, um, both of which happened, I think, in the late 1980s onwards, um, and how it was actually a collection of women, including Lema Boy, who was the, um, the author of the memoir. Um, she is a, a Nobel Peace Prize winner uh, for her work with a group of women peace builders. Um, and it was their collective action which actually brought an end to the Second Liberian Civil War, um, basically uh, elevating the role as, a, as mothers, sort of sacred mothers of the land, and saying it was their role and their purpose to rehabilitate all of these different warring factions um, and bring peace and sanity back to the land is basically how she describes it. Uh, just an absolutely phenomenal memoir and so is um, The Girl Who Smiled Be. So the name of that book is Mighty Be Your Powers if you'd like to read it by Lema Boy. Um, and so yeah, it's just been an absolute joy I think so far to be able to look at these phenomenal texts. Um, and specifically what I'm looking at is there's uh, there are a few figures in traditional political philosophy that are built with the idea of a very, um, what we'd call androcentric or male, male-centred uh, universal idea at the heart. So the idea of human rights are built on this idea of the uh, the rights of man, which don't take into account the unique experiences of people who are not men. Um, mm-hmm. uh, and particularly children as well. I mean, that's a big, big aspect of my research at the moment is the experience of children and their um, lack of political rights. So it's about sort of undertaking a feminist critique of those frameworks and those terms and trying to expand them to fit the experiences that are being relayed in these different testimonies. Um, mental health is certainly one aspect of that. Like I said, there's um, 
whenever I think you deal with anything to do with memory and and testimony and you know recollection of war, um, there will be elements of that at play as well. Um, but yeah, that's that's sort of where I'm at at the moment with my research. But it's um, I think it's a privilege to be able to work with with this kind of uh, literature. It's just um, so interesting. Mm. Sounds fascinating, and um, we'll share the links as well on social media for people who who yeah. didn't capture that. And um, and how you, you're quite near the begin. You it's not long since you started it, is it? Quite near the beginning of it. So I think maybe as it progresses as well, have you back to kind of tell us how things are, are going with it as well. But I think, like you said, there's a lot of analogies with um, with mental health, isn't there? And certainly thinking about, you know, refugees that I've worked with. And again, thinking back to voice and, and refugees I've worked with who've been who've been mothers as well and um, and how that's sort of shaped their identity in, in ways that people wouldn't expect, you know, like the people I've worked with who've been um, traumatised and have had, you know, um, pregnancies as a result of sexual assault, for example. And, um, you know, they have gone on to have a really close bond um, with babies. And, and again, you know, in um, our latest uh, mental health nurse in journal magazine, we've had a perinatal mental health feature. But I think it, it kind of reminds me of that in the sense that making sure that when we're talking about things like motherhood, that all voices are heard, because um, some of the struggles that you encounter working with women perinatally who are refugees are very different to the struggles um, with some of the, the women who are kind of mothers in western cultures as well so i think it's really interesting um what you're looking at and i'm really interested in it from a mental health point of view to see how it develops i think it's so, quite um yeah. comparing these kinds of texts i mean they're quite uh i wouldn't say mainstream because these types of voices are often very overlooked um but they are uh i certainly think might be our powers as a bestseller so um, it's thinking about how often that space is taken up by these kinds of more, more fragile, precarious voices uh, and how often they're taken up by, um, for instance, representations of, of mental health or of um, other kinds of experiences that might lead to you being more marginalised um, and how much of that space is taken up by, um, yeah, representations of, of them which are sort of built for consumption and it's, I think it's good to be have a healthy dose of criticism, I think, about um, about that sort of sphere and how much time we give to um, stories that and I don't think they always have to be like a direct testimony or a direct, you know, something that seems to be more authentic. But I certainly do think that um, it's good to remain sensitive to um, the types of narratives that we're consuming. Yeah, definitely. Nikki, anything coming through on the yeah, social media? Yeah, loads. I can hardly keep up. <laughs> so, um, um, first of all, um, people are bringing in some suggestions. So some of the suggestions we've been have seen, uh, there are actually about um, representations of mental health and mental illness. So um, uh, Black Swan has come through from Laura. Um, Alfonso uh, Pacella has talked about the scream. Um, Adrian has talked about Adrian Jogdor has talked about um, a beautiful mind, saying how it's oh, yeah. it's really interesting that sometimes people assume that, that intelligence sometimes somehow plays a factor in mental health when it doesn't in any other illness really. How mm. it's suddenly connected up incorrectly, I think sometimes there. Um, Mushtag has talked about um, saying recommendations for mental, for sort of like well-being and mental well-being. She's talked about um, living while black, the essential uh, guide to overcoming racial trauma, as being a really excellent read, a must uh, read for NHS CEOs and executive directors, particularly working in London. Um, all communities mm -hmm. should be um, represented in NHS boards and senior management. So, and thank you for the writer for bringing those really powerful words. So there's, people are coming at this from lots of different perspectives. So things that have chimed with them, things that they love, um, and things that actually are representing sort of the human experience and the experience of illness as well. Yeah. yeah. And I like the idea of books as like a prescription almost, in, but not in a medical way, in a way of like just living more widely. I love that. Mm, Thank you I for the people who are joining I, in. 
And I saw um, a, a thread on um, Twitter the other day where people were talking about um, Audible as well. So for people who are, you know, experiencing depression or other sort of mental health issues who struggle to, to concentrate, and I must admit, I struggle to concentrate myself on um, reading a lot of the time. Um, people were just talking about how, you know, Audible, for example, has kind of transformed reading experiences for people. And it's certainly something that I put on on the car in the car sometimes. If I've got mm. a long journey, um, yeah. particularly if I'm reading something more serious, and I know that I won't be able to concentrate on it by sitting and reading it, but by listening to it, I get the same experience. So mm. just throw that in there as well. And um, and what are you two? What have you two been reading and, and watching recently? I reread because this was coming up. I reread um, a short story that I've tweeted about um, before uh, called The Yellow Wallpaper, which is old. So loads of people haven't heard of it, but it is a great read. If you're working in mental health, I think it's an essential read in some ways. And it sounds a very bizarre thing, but I think as Rebecca was saying, it's absolutely an underrepresented voice. And it's a story written in the 18, mid 1800s. And already I can see it. a few people have tuned out there, but I promise it's short and it's good. And it's written almost in the style of like a gothic kind of horror story, which makes it, I think, very accessible and readable to people today. But it's a story of a woman who has um, who has a baby and is put on a rest cure for her for mental well being, and she has um, seemingly depression, maybe psychosis. It's very difficult to tell. But what she does have is a particularly overbearing husband and a particularly overbearing brother, both of whom are doctors. And so the stuff that they're talking about is so relevant you know, about paternalism, about mm. taking away patient choice, about women's experience of pain or trauma being medicalized and taken out of their hands, um, of, of experiences about not being service user led, um, and also sort of kind of fear of um, hysteria and uh, women's experiences not uh, necessarily being heard properly. So there's a lot in that book, in a really short novella. Um, I won't spoil the end for you. I mean, I don't think you can have spoilers when something's like nearly 100 years old, can you? But <laughs> I think it's a good one for people to have a look at and then think about, you know, power dynamics in their own work. So yeah. sometimes having a bit of a step back, it gives you another entry onto looking at the kind of work that that you that we do because services are still not safe for minorities. Mm -hmm. In, you know, in this country, there's still we still have you know sexual safety committees being called. We still have real issues around you know, trauma. We still have real issues around uh, women's birth experiences being safe. So yeah. yeah, none of that stuff has changed, unfortunately. Just different. So for me, that's yeah. what I would recommend: Charlotte Perkins Gilman and the Yellow Wallpaper. Yeah, and phenomenally, sort of um, so much is anticipated in that book. I think. Mm -hmm. uh, really prescient stuff and mm -hmm. uh, quite, uh, from what I remember, quite a uh, strong feminist text as well at the time, I think. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, it always reminds me, I don't know whether it was intentionally meant to follow on from this, uh, but it reminds me of um, the character of Bertha in Jane Eyre. You know, uh, that's, yeah, that's funny. Yeah. That's just what I'm thinking about, yeah. Yeah, exactly. I, I can't never remember whether it was supposed to be sort of, um, you know, resonating at least with with that experience of obviously being like locked away. Um, but there's a book that I've read sort of recently. Uh, I'd, I'd read it for like during my, my master's course, but um, it's Wide Saga mm -hmm. Um Let me just get the author's name. Oh, Jean, Jean Rees. That's it. Yeah, Jean Rees, Wide Saga Um And yeah, that's a retelling of... Um, well, the story of Jenna from the perspective of, of Bertha, whose real name is Antoinette. Um, and yeah, she's uh, a Creole woman from uh, from the West mm -hmm. Indies, uh, from, from what I remember. And um, yeah. yeah, her heritage has an awful lot to do with her experiences that she ends up having at the hands of her husband, um, which sounds, you know, really traumatic when you are able to look into her perspective in that book, which I don't think, I mean, it's, it's very much erased, isn't it? And Jenna. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So yeah, I think that all of those sorts of, um, obviously White Psychosocy is a more recent book, but I think all of those earlier classics have just got so much latent, uh, latent content that's really relevant for us to like unearth now. Mm -hmm. And again, it's like whose, whose voice is being 
when you're writing about someone, you can write anything about them. And we were talking about, you know, the power that anybody who's working in health services has to write notes about somebody else. Because yeah. um, the way that the, that, um, the character in Wise Gasso C is presented is completely not who she is compared to who she's who we first introduced to back in Jane Eyre. And in Jane Eyre, she's almost, it is racist portrayal. It's um, animalistic. It's extremely savage isn't it in the way that they they talk about her as being an unreasonable person but when you actually think about the experience of somebody who has been displaced like that who has been unloved like that it's not surprising that they respond in a range of ways is it none of that is surprising and it takes you back to that understanding of 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 what happened to that person not what's wrong with that person which is real kind of trauma informed kind of lens so again jimmy's miles ahead of her time actually changing yeah. that narrative on its head. Yeah. And I think that whole sort of intersectionality comes to mind as well, doesn't it? Because, um, you know, thinking about Jane Eyre and the Brontes, um, that, you know, fortunate at a time that women um, were able to have a have a voice through literature, although obviously in the early days they didn't, did they? Because they wrote under a different name. Um, however, um, they were still privileged, so compared to, you know, people mm. of, of colour during that mm. generation. So I think it really kind of highlights those issues for me, that yes, in some ways they were oppressed as women, um, um, but having, you know, having looked around the Bronte parsonage as well in Haworth, um, they weren't particularly underprivileged as a family. My dad was a vicar, they had a lovely house, you know, they went to school, all the rest of it. Um, so it's all about the different layers, isn't it, of, of privilege as well, I think. Mm. Um but I think, as you say, you know, some of the sort of more classic texts still really resonate. And although things have, have moved on, you know, how far have they really moved on? Mm. Um, I mean, Shakespeare being an example, um, you know, not considered that accessible to people, but so much relevance in some of his still to, to the things that go on today, particularly around women as well, I would say. Mm. Um, it's an interesting you know, one, isn't it, with... Shakespeare because what makes it what makes it relevant is because it's people's stories isn't it it's about people all the time and it's about those themes of like love hate jealousy anger yeah. and the things that are constantly our our issues now and I think for me the one that really stood out I saw Ian McKellen when I was 18 doing Iago and he was talking about kind of like the nature of evil really and I can still remember what his face looked like. And that's, I don't want to say how many years, but some considerable years ago, I can still remember what his face looked like at the end. And I can remember thinking like, it really made me um, quite confused at the time. So I always thought that people did bad things because they had a grand plan. But I think the longer I've gone through life is often people do bad things because they're lazy or they don't know any better or because they are a little bit petty. <laughs> you know, the, 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 the yeah. grand evil villain is actually quite rare. The thing you need to guard against is people getting knackered and snappy and unpleasant and fed up because that's the stuff that causes the, it's like the petty harms, you know, that build up. Yeah. And I think it really changed the way that I thought about quite a big issue. I think one that I face quite a lot in mental health, you know. That's how you manage really, that power. That's a really mm-hmm. interesting point, actually. Um, mm-hmm. It's something I've just recently been reading about, uh, the concept of the banality of evil. Um, yeah. Hannah yeah. Arendt. Yeah. yeah. And, um, yeah, I think just reading that that book for the first time, Eichmann in Jerusalem, mm-hmm. it's about, uh, for, for anyone who's, who's not familiar, it's about the trial of um, Adolf Eichmann, who was one of the, uh, one of the key architects of the Holocaust, who um, was... Uh, brought back, I think, about 20 years later um, to first trial. And mm-hmm. Hannah Arendt, who was a, um, a Jewish refugee during the Holocaust, ended up attending mm-hmm. that trial and she sort of documented it in the course of this book, uh, sort of her perspective on Eichmann and how we reacted to the accusations that were levelled to him. And she coined this term, the banality of evil, which is now, you know, really widely known. Mm-hmm. Um, but the, the specific way that she constructs it, I think, is very, very intelligent because it's almost through um it's quite an, an ironic way that she tells it i think it's 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 I- ironic that he seems like this really like this figure of really demonic evil um but in fact it was actually just selfishness personal gain um laziness as you say in some cases um that ended up leading to him um 
committing this absolutely monstrous evil. Mm. Uh, but I think you're quite right. I think that often uh, some of the worst worst instances of, of evil happening is uh, often at the hands of just um, really boring and mundane. No, it takes you back to things like Winterbourne, doesn't it? Everyone was like, "What? What was going on? What was this tremendous, you know, source of horror that went on there?" And what went on there was understaffing, people turning a blind eye, little acts of of, of something that led to something unspeakable. You know, I think that's that that stuff really helps you to kind of deconstruct that. Um, are you guys ready to talk about some paintings that people have been suggesting? Yeah. So Mike Air Academy has come through and they've picked um, the meeting on the turret stairs, which is a beautiful, quite romantic uh, picture of, um, and they're talking about it's a Danish love story that includes families rejecting partners, a stigma and more. And Alfonso obviously has talked about um, The Scream by Edvard Munch. So that's retweeted. Um, emotions, depression, anxiety and isolation. Um, I retweeted some stuff by Dolly Sen, who's a service user artist. And what I love about her is she is a proper fighter. So she will call stuff out. She will uh, use her art as a voice to really um, command the attention of people and direct it to things that are not acceptable. And I've mentioned this before, but a couple of the things that she did, which I found both hilarious and was so glad they never happened to me, was one when she turned up to, I think it was the Royal College of Psychiatrists, and sectioned them for being a danger to themselves and others, which was a beautiful piece of work. <laughs> And um, also a trip advisor of a famous South London mental health hospital um, where she reviewed it and gave it quite a poor trip advisor review, which is just taking the structures that exist and actually using them to critique the power that surrounds us. And I think those things, you know, they might not be like beautiful art in the sense of, of being something that's very pretty, but they are so powerful. And they they show you that, you know, if you want a voice, sometimes you just have to take it and say what you want to say, whether it's writing or, or art. And I, I love that about the stuff that she does. So for me, those are those are top tips. And we also retweeted the Bethlehem, who also, the Bethlehem Museum and Gallery, who also have retweeted us. Um, so if you can get to have a look at their work, please do, because they've got fantastic online resources, really, really helpful. Do you have any pictures or anything to art that you want to, to draw on, Rebecca? I think uh, rather than a specific piece of art, um, really uh, recently I went to Manchester Art Gallery just after the uh, the sort of lockdown ended and we were all allowed to go back. It's one of my favourite places. Um, has one of my favourite paintings in it, which is Hylas and the Nymphs um, mm. by uh, John William Waterhouse. And, yeah. uh, and it is one of those paintings that I really just love because it, I just think it's a beautiful painting and I like going and looking at it. Uh, and there's a couple of other beautiful paintings there. But what I thought was really interesting in the museum is um, there'd been a, uh, a sort of project or an exhibition that had happened not long before, uh, mm -hmm. and they still had sort of records of it happening with like videos and things that were being displayed. Um, and it was basically challenging the idea that when you go into a, an art gallery or a museum or any of these kinds of spaces, that mm -hmm. you have to sort of revere it. And you, this, this power relationship, the second that you walk in, that occurs because you go quiet, and you have to walk around and be really well behaved, basically. Um, mm. And, you know, it's almost continually reinforced. And even as, like, you know, many of these places are now free to enter. Mm. Um, so you think that it's sort of, you know, improving access for, for different types of people who never would have ordinarily been able to see these beautiful works of art. Mm. Um, but in, as a matter of fact, it's actually in many ways just perpetuating and reinforcing this idea that actually um, mm. this is a space of prestige and privilege and you mm. have to toe the line when you're here. So the way that they'd been challenging that was um, there was a man who was throwing empty cans of fosters around. He was handing cans of fosters out to like some of the some of the art gallery goers, and everyone was a, was a bit confused what was going on by the look of it. But um, and I think that he was wearing a dress as well. And there was just so many other things going on in this exhibition that was just challenging um, all sorts of different expectations on multiple different levels. But it was I think it was really interesting. Uh, way to address mm. uh, not only the type of material that's being shown in art galleries, mm. obviously that needs to, you know, solely needs mm. to be diversified and updated. Mm. Um, and the stories that we tell about how we came to acquire that kind of art as well and those sorts of artifacts, solely needs to be uh, mm. represented um, accurately. Um, 
but yeah, and also the way that we behave when we're in those kinds of spaces as well. So yeah, sorry, that's my take. I've gone off on a no, bit. I love that. That's my take on it. No, I love that. We um on the nursing course, we actually have sort of like event brights where we go out to uh, sort of local galleries. We're really lucky being in London because we've got free stuff around, which isn't the case for everybody. Um, and we will go out. We'll, we'll go out and bring members of the public with us as well. So it's just an event bright community meeting. We'll go and we'll go and have a look at stuff. And it's always really striking that whenever we go anywhere, we're the most diverse group in in anywhere we go, art wise. Yeah. And it's you know everybody pays for this stuff. It belongs to everybody. Um, and I think it's really important that we we take a turn of going and have a look at it as well. Because it's not always easy to do it. But if you're intimidated by marble floors and big doors, how on earth are you going to stand up for a patient in the middle of a ward round? You know, there's some things to be said about finding your place and taking up your space that's yours. So, yeah, it's an interesting one. And another top tip is the British Museum has a really interesting gallery on medicine, as does the Welcome Gallery up by St Pancras. If anyone's travelling through London, it's always a good place to stop off. But it has... Um, a big um, exhibition of all the medication that a man and a woman take throughout the course of their life. Mm -hmm. And it's really interesting because the women's one is about mm -hmm. twice as big as the men because all the fertility stuff falls pretty much solely on women to take care of. And so that's really, really interesting. And all the there's like beauty stuff that's not on the men's one. There's no men, men out there really taking a lot of um, vitamins and supplements for their hair to grow long or their eyelashes to grow super long. <laughs> that's stuff that women are doing. So it's it's really interesting to look at how people are accessing health, what health means to different people. Um, and if you want to sort of get engaged in that sort of stuff, those are fantastic places to go. And you can see a lot of that stuff online as well. So we'll tweet that out too. Absolutely brilliant ways of opening stuff up. Mm. Hmm. Oh, I've got another one come through. Um, and you were saying about accessibility. So sometimes it's about how we... Um, we see different perspectives but i think adrian said here any film uh, program that represents people with autism and uh, autism spectrum disorders is insightful and there's one about to come out called how how why i jump and it not only looks beautiful but i think it's going to really open stuff up for people in terms of thinking and debating that um, another top tip is for me is a book of poetry which is very unusual for me so there's, no, there's nothing I hate more than bad poetry like I really you know often you see a lot of kind of like nurse poets and I want to be supportive because obviously but I just hate that rhymey nonsense of, you know ah, people like to set like roll out things like the crabbit old woman I don't know if you've come across that poem mm -hmm. Rebecca I, it's and I, and I know that some people really get something out of it. Cause basically, the point of it is, I wasn't always an old lady. One time I was young. And I'm like, what are you trying to say? That she's like worth less now or that, that her worth has come from the fact that one time she wasn't really... I just, I just try, the whole thing drives me mad. You should just respect people, however old they are, just the, the whole bit of it. But it really helps some people focus. Um, for me, one thing that I absolutely loved was a, a, a New Zealand poem poet who's a, a bloke, who's a GP, and he wrote How We Fell, and he also wrote one about being a doctor. And How We Fell is the most gorgeous set of poems about falling in love and having your heart broken. And I think that's one of the things that's, you know, I remember reading it just after I'd, one of the many times it didn't work out for me. <laughs> it was just this really amazing thing to know you weren't by yourself. And yeah. I think, you know, when I look at service user art, I think that's probably one of the most important things that is accomplished by service shoes of art because it's not about us learning all the time off people's art and in that kind of like assuming everything is our for our benefit and our education but the idea about you're not by yourself if you've ever felt so alone or if you ever felt that you can't go on somebody else has done that too and this is what it looks like for them and I think that stuff is so valuable I don't know what you guys think about kind of service shoes of art and, mm -hmm. and using art as a way of connection I think um it's back to what we were saying before as well about it's not about producing a masterpiece and we need to demystify mm. that so when we're encouraging um people to participate in art it's kind of breaking down that barrier that it doesn't matter if you're not artistic or you don't consider yourself artistic it's about what you want to create and it's about feelings and and um and kind of communicating something through through art but i think a lot of people are really put off um, by getting involved with that because they don't think that they're they're artistic or they don't have any um, sort of creative ability. Same with writing, isn't it, as mm -hmm. well? I think writing's, um, a, you know, a very similar process. There's a lot of um, debate going on currently about poetry um, because obviously there's a lot of internet um, poets, um, for example, on Instagram. And yes, yeah, yeah. some, 
some of it is clickbait and and kind of nonsense. Mm. Um, but equally, there's a lot of um, sort of academic snobbery going on about mm. uh, them kind of breaking with traditional form and it not being, um, you know, proper poetry because it doesn't follow the rules of poetry. But actually, you know, mm. you know, shouldn't we be disrupting those rules? Shouldn't yeah. no? Shouldn't poetry be constantly evolving? But also, maybe people who write poetry on Instagram or um, on YouTube don't write poetry um, because they want. Um, you know, to kind of be applauded for being technically um, amazing <laughs> in mm. terms of the poetry they've written. Maybe they actually want to use poetry to communicate a message or to, you know, as Nikki, you've just said, to share an experience and, um, you know, maybe there's room for both. And um, Nick, uh, Rebecca and I were um, discussing this recently, weren't we, um, about Holly, Holly McNish, who um, is a poet who... Um, she's produced like um, a video about breastfeeding sort of spoken word video and um and it's been criticized as has her work generally because it doesn't follow the sort of technical um rules of of poetry but actually is you know um she's got a huge following and a lot of people relate to her poetry so who's uh, you know and she's been successfully published because of her poetry and i guess that's that's the thing isn't it that publishing itself is changing so um you know in the past only a small number of people were published but now people can self-publish and actually when people self-publish often publishers then give people contracts on the back of that because it you know it's kind of power to the people isn't it demonstrates who's interested in 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 their poetry so i think um I think poetry and art, you know, who's to say that it has to follow certain technical academic rules? Who's to say that people can't use poetry to communicate a message? Um, you know, it doesn't require talent. Everybody's creative, I think, in their own way, aren't they? It's just about finding finding your, your medium for, for writing or drawing or whatever it might be, photography. Um, yeah. So, yeah. I think with, with Holly as well, Holly McNish, um, uh with that poem in particular um i think like if anyone wanted to find it it's probably one of the top results that you get when you search your name in youtube a mm -hmm. really really good piece i think for, for anyone to listen to um but it, it again comes back to this idea of the subject matter and the form um coming together in like really interesting ways uh people criticize holly's work and um other poets like ruby carr and um you know, numerous other younger um, often um, and new reports uh, because the, the form of the work doesn't match up with sort of conventional poetry or it's experimental or it's quite uh, minimalist in some ways um, and those critiques almost always leave out the fact that the, the subject matter of what this poetry is dealing with is often very unconventional, it's often to do with topics that aren't addressed all that often either to do with mental health or to do with other stigmatised things like breastfeeding in public, as that uh, poem was, was one example of. Um, and sort of the the less talked about side of motherhood, I think, is what Holly um, ordinarily addresses in her poetry. Um, but yeah, it's uh, sometimes maybe that type of form and maybe some, it, it wouldn't work if you were to try and follow um, very academic conventions of poetry or, I mean, I'm not a poet and I'm, I'm not a sort of a poetry specialist, but um, I can certainly appreciate it. And, um, I can't really see how that you could sort of find grounds for a critique uh, on like a new experimental style, for instance. I think that that just is um, elitist, is my opinion on it. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Agreed. Was that, I mean, I can see we're getting towards, we've, we've zoomed through 40 minutes. <laughs> I don't know how we've done that. Um, but um, I know it's in the notes, we've got Great Gatsby there. So did, did we talk about that before we head out? Yes, I think that was it was your, your suggestion, Vanessa, yesterday when we were catching up, and it just straight away prompted a lot of ideas for me. I'm sure that you'll have a um, a really different interpretation of it, but for me, I just thought yeah. I've been thinking more and more lately, and I'm certainly not the first person to say this because I'm sure that I probably picked this up off Twitter or somewhere. Um, but the idea that yeah, the Great Gatsby is obviously set in this period of um, massive excess and massive inequality following. Uh, a really traumatic and um, all-encompassing war uh, and as everyone's trying to work through these uh, very intense emotions and recover and come back from that um, 
yeah, they're just it's constant distraction and constant, uh, you know, dealing with very intense relationships and um, all sorts of other things that are going on. So I've heard that people say, well, maybe we'll enter into a new phase that's sort of reminiscent of like a Gatsby era following COVID and following all of the trauma that people have dealt with and um, the intense deprivation that people have had to deal with. Maybe we'll have a new period of excess. And there are lots of other parallels as well, I think, with today mm -hmm. with almost influencer culture and like the excess of Gatsby himself and what he's trying mm -hmm. to achieve in the book. Um, but yeah, that's like straight away when you mentioned it, I was like, I think that that's like a, a brilliant text to sort of think about mm. in comparison to the times we're living in. Yeah, and it's quite a short story as well. And obviously there's a film version, which is is very good. I mean, for me, it's interesting, isn't it, how we read different things into it? Because for me, what really interests me is the sort of concept of new money and old money and um, the capitalist kind of concept that although he um, has money, it's new money. And although, you know, old money comes to his parties, he isn't really accepted by them. And the woman that he obviously loves, which represents kind of his kind of gateway into another world. So, you know, is it love or is it that she kind of represents a gateway into the world where he wants to be accepted? You know, ultimately he's rejected, isn't he? And he dies alone because um, whilst it might seem that, you know, he's part of a circle and he's included, he isn't really included. It's all very superficial. And I think, you know, there are definitely parallels there within mental health about kind of we talk the talk about inclusion and participation, but is it really meaningful? Um, you know, they're still in groups and out groups, if we're honest. And I think for me, it kind of really portrays that. But yeah, I think it's a great book. I mean, I read it in one sitting. I love it. And um, I think the, the film's brilliant as well. Leonardo DiCaprio, I think, plays it really well, plays the part really well. I think he's a perfect Gatsby. So, yeah, I'd recommend it. Yeah, I think it's interesting as well how sometimes film can capture different aspects of, like, different psychological aspects. Yeah. A lot better than books can sometimes. Yeah. Um, loads of times people will say, well, you know, the film wasn't as, as good as the book. But I think sometimes it does add that element of, mm -hmm. uh, especially that sort of retelling of, of The Great Gatsby because obviously like all of the visuals and the colours and things are so intense. Yeah. Um, it really like adds a new dimension to it. Um, but yeah, I think like thinking about this idea of an in-group and an out-group, I think even in the context of academia as well, um, mm -hmm. often the types of things that we're trying to work to address um, through the very, the very structures of academia are, are very difficult yeah. to, to deconstruct. And so often um, we'll be talking the talk about again inclusion and uh, decolonizing certain aspects of, of academia while actually being quite hypocritical in some ways and reinforcing others so um there's so much work still to be done i think but uh a, a definitely a good sort of text to start prompting conversations like that mm, definitely yeah. um a couple of good ones as well i mean obviously um on, on the course that i went um students take a piece of art and then they talk about it in regards to health and well-being or their own practice and some of the ones I've seen that have been amazing that made me think about you, Becca, was one person or a couple of people took that picture, Migrant Mother, um, and actually mm -hmm. really explored that. And it's a, a portrait, a, a, a black and white photo from like the 20s of the Dust Bowl America, um, looking at a mum with just looking into the distance, just absolutely in despair with sort of three kids all cl cl clutched around her. And they were saying that it was so rare to think of um, a refugee being white. And they were saying how interesting that was and about the importance of of how of, of nursing being specifically targeted at sort of vulnerable groups and actually thinking about how we focus there. And I loved that. I thought it was a really interesting bit of work. Um, somebody else had got a 12th century kind of picture of Madonna feeding, not the not that Madonna, the Madonna. <laughs> it's not loud. Yeah. Um, breastfeeding a baby and saying, you know, this is something which was seen as sort of like a kind of sacred thing, a kind of great thing to look at mm. and in today's society you know we're sending women into the toilets to feed their babies like it's a shame yeah. and that's not the point of it and I was like wow that's my kid and then there was another person who was looking at um uh, a sculpture I think it's Barbara Hepworth I want to say maybe it's not uh, but it's of a of a mum of a baby and a mum and the baby comes away from the mum and they'd used it they were a children's nurse and they were talking about attachment theory and I was like there's nothing that you can't use to help you get better at your job Hmm. If you if you are seeking information, seeking knowledge, you can learn off experiences, you can learn in a classroom, but you can learn from life, can't you? You can learn from watching TV, you can learn from books, movies, all that stuff. 
And I think, mm. particularly with CPD being in the way that it is right now, that it's quite wise for nurses to diversify as much as they can and think about where they get their new ideas from and to be as, as sort of like broad in that as possible. Yeah. Well, that's all I had to say about that. <laughs> yeah. Relax. Yeah. Um, I'm just looking at the time. We're probably kind of coming to an end yeah. anyway. Um, I think we're, we're even overrunning by five minutes even, aren't we? So there's lots more we could talk about, but I think um, it's a really good um, good point to end. And I think it's been interesting, you know, how many people have participated in the yeah. discussion tonight as well, which, um, which kind of shows that um, it kind of applies to all of us, doesn't it? And something yeah. that interests, interests us all, so... Maybe it's something to, for us to absolutely just roll back on. And maybe even next time what we could do, if anyone wants to recommend anything for us to look at, we can actually all look at it ahead of time and then put it up online so that people can see it. So we're all talking about the same thing. And that would be an interesting yeah. one to do. Particularly if it's something a bit that we don't maybe focus on, something like sculpture or even, and seeing yeah. how that takes us in a different direction. But I love yeah. that. Thank you ever so much people for participating today. Yeah, that's a good idea. Maybe focus on one one in particular next time yeah mm. yeah so um i mean for me it's just been really interesting there's so much more that it would have been useful to explore but i think as you say we can come back to this um i think um yeah i mean it's the subject that i'm really interested in and i'm, I'm fairly lost for words which is unlike me <laughs> um i need to pro process it but i do think i suppose for me what's interesting is even between us the three of us who were all quite similar in our values and mindsets i would say all had quite different interpretations of of similar pieces of material and i think um i think that's really striking isn't it so I think that I will end on that note and also thank Rebecca as well for joining us. Absolutely. Thank you very much for having me. It's been it's been so nice to uh to catch up with you all and yeah, just have this really interesting conversation. But um I'd love to uh, if I can contribute anything in future or uh, or participate, I'd absolutely love to do that. But um thank you for having me. Yeah, no, it's been great. Yeah. Take care, everybody. Good night. Good night. Bye.